Well, open your Bibles if you have them. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. Uh, we're in verses 12 to 27 together. We'll uh, start in verse 12 and finish the end of the chapter. As you make your way there in your Bibles, it's been some time since we've been back together, uh, we're continuing to look at the life, the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus, we know, is in the final week of his life. This is actually the night before his crucifixion. And Jesus is spending those final hours that he has with his disciples, preparing them for what lies ahead of them. Jesus is about to be crucified on a cross. He's about to die, be buried, the third day rise again from the dead. But he's not just preparing them for what lies ahead of them in the next 24 to 48 hours, uh, what lies ahead in the next week or so. But uh, after 40 days after his resurrection, he's going to ascend to heaven. He's going to leave his disciples. They are going to be an extension of his words and of his works. They are going to do ministry on this earth without him. But while he will not be here physically, his spirit will be in them. And so Jesus instructs them, this is how you do ministry without me. The Holy Spirit who's going to enable you, empower you, he indwells you, and this is an encouragement to you. Now, these disciples are still with Jesus as we find ourselves where we're at here today. We're still waiting for Christ to return. We have the hope of Christ's return, and uh, we are going to be with God and his people as he consummates his kingdom. But uh, until he returns, how are we to accomplish the ministry that he's called us to? The ministry that we have individually, the ministry that we have as a church, how do we fulfill that? And Christ gives these instructions in chapter 15. And in the first 11 verses, when we were together last, we talked about Jesus' instructions on our relationship to him. You see, even though Jesus is going to leave and the Holy Spirit indwells us, Jesus gives the instructions to his disciples, stay connected to me. He used the illustration, the metaphor of a vineyard. Jesus said, I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser or the gardener. He's the one who prunes. He cuts down that which is fruitful so that it'll be more fruitful. He not just cuts down, but he cuts off those things that don't bear fruit. And then he says, you are the branches. Jesus says, this is how you stay connected to me, abide, remain. And so he gives instructions in the first 11 verses on our relationship to him. Stay connected to me, Jesus says. Now as we continue, he's going to give instructions on our relationship to one another in verses 12 to 17, and then our relationship to the world in verse 18 and following. And we'll conclude in verse 27, but as you go into chapter 6 all the way to verse 4, you see even more instructions in regards to our relationship with the world, and we'll take a peek at that together this evening. And so the question we've been asking in our study, though, is as we read the instructions that Jesus gives in relationship to him, fellow believers, and the world, what do these instructions reveal about who Jesus is? Because John's purpose in writing, if I can bring you back to the purpose statement of the book in chapter 20, verse 31, is these things are written, many miracles were done by Jesus, but these were written so that you and I may believe. Uh, not just anything about Jesus, but that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. And so as we walk through our text, we're going to ask and answer the question, what do the instructions of Jesus in our relationship to one another in the world reveal about who he is? Let's go ahead and read the text, chapter 15, picking up in verse 12, reads this way. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, 
the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without cause. Verse 26, but when the helper comes whom I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Word of the Lord. Um, as we walk through our text together, what do these instructions given to Jesus' disciples about their relationship to one another and the world reveal about him? And first, in verses 12 to 17, these instructions reveal that Jesus is our friend. What a wonderful thing to think about. Jesus is our friend. Jesus gives these instructions in regards to their relationship with one another and he describes those who he would call friends. Now, these are helpful to consider in relationship to because if we're believers, if we're followers of Christ, we're not just servants and slaves of Christ, but he calls us friends. Now, that's an encouragement, that's a comfort, but if you're going to say that Jesus is your friend and God is your friend and God calls you a friend, make sure that you follow what Christ shares about who his friends are. And so as we pick up in the text, who does Jesus describe as his friends? He describes his friends as those who know his command. They know his command to love one another. Uh, first, they know his command in regards to the origin of the command. Jesus begins and he says, this is my command that you love one another. First, we're reminded that it's from him. Now, if Jesus was just a man or if Jesus was just a prophet and Jesus just gave some of his opinions, that would be one thing. But when Jesus says, this is my command, we know that Jesus isn't just a man or a prophet. He's the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is our commanding officer. We are his followers, and we surrender and submit our lives to him, and so we better know his commands. If you join the military, you learn very quickly your rank, and you also learn the rank of your superior commanding officer. And as you learn where your position is and what his or her position is, you learn very quickly that as your commanding officer, you better know what they've commanded and you better know that you've been called to obey them. Because as your commanding officer, you place yourself under their authority, you place yourself under their leadership, so you better get to know their commands. Jesus is our commanding officer. We submit and surrender to him. We place ourselves under his authority. And so when Jesus speaks, our ears perk up because we want to know how we can serve our master. Jesus says, my friends are those who know my command. They know the origin of the command. Secondly, they know the, the content of the command. This is my commandment that you love one another. How? As I have loved you. That you love one another. The word love there in the Greek is agape. Uh, in English, we only have one word for love. In the Greek, you may have heard it, there are different words used to describe different kinds of love. You know, in English, when I say I love cake, I use the same word that I use to say I love my wife or I love my friends. Uh, but those are not the same kinds of love. In Greek, you have the word uh, uh, phil philio, where you get the word Philadelphia. That means brotherly love. Um, in, in the scriptures, you don't see the word eros, but that's another Greek word that speaks of romantic love. But the word that's used here is not uh, 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 that fickle love in regards to eros or uh, that love for a brother in which we treat others like family but this is a different kind of love it's an agape love and and in the first century it wasn't a term that was used a lot and it's the term that speaks of God's love throughout scripture it's a love that is sacrificial 
It's a love that is selfless. It's a love that is unconditional. The content of the command is love one another with a agape love. And Jesus says, love one another. How? As I have loved you. It's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to love them like I love cake. That's one thing. Uh, I'm going to love them like I love my friends. No, G G it, the command of Jesus is you go beyond that. You love them whether they deserve it or not. You love them by putting their needs before your own selflessly. You love them sacrificially. And Jesus says, love them as I have loved you. And our immediate thought goes to the extent of God's love exemplified through his sacrifice and his death on the cross. But that's one part of his expression of love. Now, let me remind you, Jesus has been with his disciples for three years. He's been walking with them. How has he shown his love to them over these three years? Well, number one, he calls them by name. He calls different disciples who have different occupations. Some are fishermen, and he goes up to those disciples and says, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And he, he calls them by name. If you're going to love like Jesus loves, that's a good first step. Get to know one another's names. If you're going to love like Jesus loves, get to know your fellow believers that Jesus has placed in the church. And so Jesus, he, he got to show his love for his disciples by calling them by name, getting to know them, but, th but secondly, by spending time with them. Now, Jesus didn't just meet with his disciples every couple weeks for a small group meeting. Jesus didn't even meet with his disciples and said every week we're going to meet together on Sunday or, or Saturday and we're going to meet together and we're going to talk together and then the rest of the week you do what you're going to do and then we'll meet again on Sunday. Jesus didn't say we'll, we'll meet every now and again. Jesus spent quality time with his disciples and he said come follow me. He wasn't just saying hey follow me on Sunday and then do what you're going to do on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Jesus said, follow me. He said, follow me in the sense that I'm going to spend every moment with you. And as Jesus spent time with them, he also did ministry with them. All 12 of his disciples, he showed them how to do ministry. He, he did it. He, he, he proclaimed the words and, the, and showed the works that he did. And he also called his disciples to, to, to do the same. And he's equipping them for the work that they're going to do without, them, without him. But he spent quality time with them. He showed his love by spending time with them. But he also showed his love by serving them. Uh, we got to see even during this upper room discourse as Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples and he served them over these three years teaching. He's, he's done mighty miracles before them. He, he's taken care of them. And, and then he, he, if you remember earlier, he took off his outer garment while they were eating dinner together, enjoying the Passover meal. And he goes and puts on the garment of the least ranked servant in the house, the one who who washes the feet of the guests. And then one by one, he goes and washes each of the disciples' feet. He gets to Peter. You know what Peter says? No, 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 don't wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you, you, you have, you, you, you're, you're not with me. You have no p place with me. And, and so Peter says, well, wash all of me then. And Jesus says, no, if, if I've washed your feet, it's sufficient. Jesus wasn't talking just about feet, right? He's talking about the heart. If I wash your heart through the sacrificial death on the cross that he's going to provide, you are all clean and all of you is clean so nothing else needs to be clean. And then Jesus told his disciples, if I, as I have washed your feet, did he say wash my feet? No, he says wash one another's feet. When Jesus says love as I have loved you, he's saying not just knowing one, uh, there are one another's names, spending time with them, but serving them and of course ultimately sacrificing on their behalf and so Jesus calls his friends those who know his command know the the origin of it the, the content of it but also the extent of it and in the next verse verse 13 he tells us the extent he says this greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends he describes for us the extent of love that we should have for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's an agape love. 
When I think of the extent of love sometimes with my daughters and I, we're talking and I, I tell them, hey, you know, you know how much I love you, right, girls? I love you this much. And they say, oh, really, Daddy? We, well, I love you even more and I love you this much, right? And then I tell them, no, I love you to the moon and back. And they'll say, no, I love you even further than the moon and back. The extent of love is not summed up in what we say. The extent of love is summed up in what we do. And Jesus says there's no greater love than this, than one lay his life down for his friends. And Jesus doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. I'm not just going to get to know you, spend time with you, serve you. I'm going to sacrifice my life for you. My blood is going to be shed. I'm going to go get crucified on a cross and excruciating and humiliating death for you. Not because I deserve it, but in order to grant you forgiveness and everlasting life. That is the extent of love. And Jesus says, as I have loved you, love one another. You know, some people say children, they, they know if you genuinely love them or not. And they spell love T I M E. I've heard that a lot, and I like that saying. It's like, yeah, you, but, but I like to suggest children and everyone else knows that love isn't spelled T I M E because you can spend time with people, but it might not be quality time. Like, I can spend time with you and, and be texting on my phone, or, or my mind is somewhere else. You know, I get home talking to my wife. I'm spending time with her, but, you know, my mind is somewhere else. No, 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 no. The way it's spelled is S A C R I F I C E. Love is spelled sacrifice. And how we sacrifice for those we love, that is the extent of love that we're talking about. How you sacrifice your time. How you sacrifice your priorities. Putting God first. Putting, put, put, putting those things first. The church second. You know, those kind of things. Your relationship, if you're married, second, right? Christ comes first. Your, your, your spouse comes second. You've got, got the church as well. You've got your, your job. You've got friends. You've got family. You've got your hobbies somewhere down over here, right? And so true love is expressed in sacrifice. And so the question presents itself, how much do we love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I love you enough to say hi to you on Sunday morning. I may love you enough to get to know your name and say, hey, I forgot your name last week, but I'll try this week and do a better job. <laughs> I can show you even more love by spending quality time with you, maybe serving a need that you have someone sick or they have a surgery and so we, we bring them a meal. That's a good way to show our love for them. But... but how much are we willing to sacrifice for them? If your brothers or sisters in Christ call you up at 1 a.m. in the morning because uh, they're stuck on the highway and their car broke down, or are you the type of person to say, okay, I'm going. How much are you willing to sacrifice for your brothers and sisters in Christ? That's the love that we are called to share one with another. And Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another. No greater love than a, uh, than a man lay his life down for his friends. You know, there are certain people that I would say, yeah, I can I lay down my wife, life for my wife. Yeah, I can do that. My children? Oh, yeah, but the person sitting next to me in my chair right now, you know, am I really able to do that? And it's like, God, I don't even know if I have the capacity to love with an agape love. Maybe a filial love, you know, a, a, a family-like love. What do you do when you fall short? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, I fall short. I don't have that, that capacity that is apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we need the Spirit to enable and empower us to, uh, to do what God has called us to do. And so who does Jesus call his friends? He calls his friends those who know his commands. Secondly, those who obey his commands. Verse 15, he goes on to say, No longer do I call you servants for a, for a oh, verse 14, excuse me. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, Jesus didn't just say, uh, you are my friends if you do mm, 80% of what I command you. <laughs> he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Jesus says, I'm your commanding officer. 
As your commanding officer, I don't just want you to obey 90% of the time or 95% of the time or even 99% of the time. I call you friends when you do whatever I tell you to do. Once again, we're not perfect. I miss the mark. I fall short daily. Thank God all sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. But the manner in which we pursue the kind of obedience that Christ calls us to as his friends that he refers to us as is by means of pursuing this obedient life. You wake up in the morning. What does that look like practically for you and for me? God, my first thought is not the agenda for the day. My first thought is not the worries that I have or, 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 or scrolling on social media. My first thought is you. And as I submit to you and, and focus myself on you, Lord, I want to walk in obedience to your word and your will. And I'm going to be ready to do what you've called me to do and be prepared even if I should experience some adversity today because I'm here to serve you, honor you, and glorify you. Elsewhere in Scripture, John 14, 15, last chapter, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You say, Jesus, I, I love you. Well, well, do you do what he tells us to do? Now, your children come up to you and say, Daddy, Mommy, I, I love you. And then they go and walk in rebellion. You say, you, you're not showing me you really love me. If you really love me, you'll, you'll do what I, I tell you to do because uh, I know what's best for you and I, I, I'm seeking what's best for you. Do what I say. And, and ultimately here, Jesus says, you don't, you don't love me unless you do what I tell you. So, so Jesus calls his friends, those who know his command, those who obey whatever he commands, and lastly, those who enjoy his benefits of being his friends. If Jesus calls you a friend, what a great benefit that is. What's the benefit? First, he doesn't just call you a slave or a servant. He calls you a friend. Next verse, verse 15, it, it, it says, No longer do I call you servants. The word servant there is doulos. It's the word for slave. So the better translation is not servant, it's a slave. I don't call you slaves for, for a servant. A slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I've heard from my father. I have made known to you. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes when you're ta ta talking with folks, sometimes they'll name drop. I know so-and-so. Uh, maybe they're an important person. Maybe they're in the, in the workplace. They know the boss of the boss of the boss or the owner of the company, whatever that is. And I, I think of it in this way, however you feel about our government leaders. What if someone came up to you and you were saying, you know, I really don't like the way things are going in the country. Or I like this or I like that. And they say, well, guess what? I know the governor of Oregon. I don't just know them I know them as my friend and they call me their friend. What if the President of the United States, you, you, regardless of how you feel about him, you know, uh, you get to name drop. Someone, someone tells you, listen, uh, you, you have some problems with the, the way they make decisions or, or you like this decision that they make. Guess what? Uh, I don't just have to talk about what they do. Uh, they call me their friend. Jesus says, I call you my friend. He's not saying, he's not saying that, that, that you call me your friend. He's saying, I call you my friend. You're not just a slave. You're not just a servant in my eyes. You're my friend. What a great benefit. I am a friend of God. You ever talk to people and they're like, ah, oh, uh, I, don't, I don't know why God does this or God does that or, or why God allows evil in the world. Hey, <laughs> I'm a friend of God. Let me sit down and chat with you about him. He calls me friend. Uh, but be careful if you say that because you better know his command to love one another and obey whatever he commands you and enjoy the benefits that he gives you. You, you know, you want to be a good witness of that, but God calls us a friend. That's a great benefit, not just a slave or a servant, but a friend. That's exciting. That's a great blessing. Secondly, the benefit of, of being called his friend is, is that we know the truth. We know the truth. It, it goes on to say in verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. 
Um, you and I know this. We know the redemptive plan of God over salvation. You know, in, in, in the Old Testament, uh, they just saw things in part. There were prophecies, there were proclamations that foretold what was to come. They couldn't see everything in whole. You and I, we're the friends of Jesus and we read scripture and we know the whole redemptive plan of history from beginning to end. We know about the fall and we know Genesis 3.15 when the hope comes out from the, the seed of the woman will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. I mean the good news is declared right at the beginning. You know when you read books like Job and Job has no idea why he's experiencing the suffering that he's experiencing. We get to read behind the scenes. We know what's happening behind the scenes. Why? We're God's friends. We know the redemptive plan of history. So when someone's asking, how do you get in a right standing with God? You know, I feel like there's, there's something separating me from God. Hey, I'm God's friend. He talks to me in his word. I chat with him in prayer. I am his friend. Let me take some time to talk to you about him. He calls us friends. But I've called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. What the Father has made known to the Son, the Son has made known to us is made known to his disciples. Isn't that encouraging? God doesn't keep you in the dark about these things. It's no longer a mystery. It's been made known to us. We are God's friends. And then the next benefit is, is we were chosen and appointed. As his friends, you and I were chosen and appointed. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Wow. And so we just talked about, you know, it's difficult to obey whatever he commands us. It's, 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 it's one thing to obey partly. It's a hard thing every day to pursue perfection. But God's not just looking for perfection. He's looking for a heart that surrendered to him because he has chosen us. He has appointed us. And God will not expect out of us what he will not provide for us. You don't. Walk in obedience through the power of your own strength. You stay connected to the vine. You remain in him. You abide in him. And if you're bearing fruit, guess what? He prunes us so that we'll bear even more fruit. What a blessing that is to know he makes us even more fruitful. He's chosen us and appointed us to not just bear fruit, but that the fruit would remain. It doesn't disappear. The fruit remains. And we, when we are fruitful, are walking in obedience to God. And this is not just talking about spiritual maturity, right? As, as we're bearing fruit. This is speaking about the fruit of our ministries. As we go out and make disciples, we get to know God in his word. And then we go out and make him known. We get to know him in, our, in his word and then we go home and tell our children about it. We get to know him in his word and then we go out into the workplace and talk about him. As we get to know him, we make him known and we bear much fruit. And then lastly, it also says that the benefit is answered prayer. You're a friend of God and as a friend of God, he answers your prayers. When you know his commands when you obey whatever he commands you you know his word and so whatever you pray you're going to pray in his name that's the key term there because he doesn't just give you anything you pray for he gives you whatever you pray in his name it's not just saying in Jesus name and somehow there's some magical power there but in Jesus name means that we pray in accordance with his will when we pray in the name of Jesus, we pray according to the will of Jesus. What a wonderful thing to know, to say, Jesus, I'm praying for this or I'm praying for that and I know it's your will and so you're gonna give it. You're gonna provide it and my prayers are prayed with that in mind. And then he, he, he finishes up verse 17 and he finishes what he, he began and he says, these things I command you that you love one Another, something else Jesus' friends know is they know how to please him. Jesus is not just our master and we are his slave and his servant, even though that's part of it. He's our commanding officer. We serve him, we honor him, we worship him, we give our lives for him. He's paid the ultimate price so we can live, so we live for him now. Not only do we live for him, but we know what pleases him, and so we want to please him. We wake up in the morning and, and we don't wake up and say, oh man, I've got to go walk on obedience to God. 
No, I get to walk in obedience to God through the empowerment of his Holy Spirit and enjoy all the benefits of being a child of God. Even in the face of adversity, I know that he is my shepherd. He leads me and guides me, whether by still waters or through dark valleys. He is with me, his rod and his staff. They come from me. I want to please Jesus because I love him in response to his love for me. And so who does Jesus call his friends? He, he calls those his friends who know his command, obey whatever he commands, and enjoy the benefits that come with being his friend. What do these instructions about our relationship with one another reveal about Jesus? Jesus is our friend. I hope you can leave today with that in mind. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of Jesus. I know him. I know his word. I've gotten to know his word and, I, and I've learned to walk in obedience to it, not in my own strength or my power, but in submission to the Holy Spirit that indwells me moment by moment and day by day. That's the Christian life. That's the Christian walk. So if I could ask us a couple of questions as we get to know God's command as we get to know one another, spend time with one another, serve one another, and sacrifice for one another. How can we do a better job of showing this kind of love Jesus talks about to fellow believers in the church? Are there practical ways we can do this? What comes to mind for you as, as you hear the command that we're given? Yeah. And so getting to know the needs of our fellow believers and having a heart to meet them where we can or find someone in the church who can't because sometimes someone comes to you and they share a need and certainly you can't meet that need but you know someone in the body who can and that's a great opportunity to help meet that need. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Serving. Yeah. Anything else? Spending time in prayer with other people. Our family here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Marianne was saying just uh, praying for folks. It's one thing to spend time with folks. Uh, intimate time where you can be transparent in prayer goes such a long ways. And uh, especially when you have a need, you know, and someone prays for you, it's such an encouragement to know they're praying for you. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Be more sacrificial with time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just prioritizing folks with your time and in your schedules. Um, can I ask this? How have you personally experienced the kind of love that Jesus describes here in the body of Christ? Any particular ways people have shown you love in, in the church, the way that Jesus describes that love? Yeah, Charlie. Yeah. 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 We feel loved when we're fed, especially when we have difficulty making our own meals or life is chaotic. What a blessing to have meal trains within the, within the church. Yes. Meal trains are a blessing. Any, any other ways you've been blessed and felt loved the way that Jesus describes this love? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah, people in the church invest in their kids. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, what, what a blessing to have uh, other folks in the church minister to our children and to those in our family. It's one thing if we say it to them, it's another thing when a fellow believer says it and sometimes it gets through through them. That's a big blessing, yeah. Did I see a hand over here? Yeah, yeah, Jerry. Yeah. Drives all the way out to a favorite coffee shop of mine and buys me a latte, which she knows I really like, and brings it back. Right? Yeah. She doesn't have to do that. <laughs> bringing a coffee to somebody. Now she's got you hooked, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many ways our church takes time to show us genuine love. And when you see it, take time to thank God for it. That's what God has commanded us to do, to love one another. And that's one of the ways we know that we're his friends, by our love one for another. And it, and it is extended all the way to the point of of sacrificing our lives on behalf of others. And so, uh, knowing that command to love one another, Steve, did you want to say something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when someone sends us a quick, just a verse to encourage us or a, uh, a text, that's a, a great blessing. Um, so knowing his command, that, that's what makes us friends. Uh, uh, how do we apply the next one? N obeying the commands, whatever he tells us, simply by abiding, that's the one. Simply remaining in him. Uh, we're not pursuing perfection, we're just simply pursuing him. And when we pursue him, that's who are his friends. And, and then as we walk through uh, w practically, what does it look like to enjoy the, the benefits of Jesus? I put declaration statements that you can remind yourself of in the morning. The first one is, I am a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. He calls me friend. And so that's an encouragement to me to walk in obedience to his will and his word. Secondly, I know the truth of God. God has revealed his redemptive plan to me. What a blessing that is. I know the truth of it. It encourages me. Uh, thirdly, I am chosen and appointed to bear fruit. I have been chosen and appointed by Jesus to bear fruit. Fourthly, I'm assured of answered prayer when I pray in his name. Wow. Wow. I know him, and when I pray to him, he, he's got all the resources in the world. If you need anything, he'll provide it. And then fifthly, I know how to please him. I know how to please him by loving my fellow believers in Christ. A wonderful thing, you know, when, when you think about God, then he's smiling down on you when you love your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, uh, what do we learn about Jesus as he instructs us in our relationships one to another? Uh, we learn that he's our friend. Secondly, what do we learn about Jesus in his instruction in our relationship to the world? We're reminded that he is our helper. He is our helper who prepares us for what lies ahead of us so that we can be a good witness for him. What we're going to see in, in a moment as we walk through our text is that God gives a purpose to pain. Uh, God provides meaning to adversity. Even when it comes to the pressures of persecution or hostility or hatred from the world, God uses that. He doesn't waste it so that we can be a good witness for him. Not just ourselves, but the Holy Spirit who bears witness in and through us and to those who are persecuting us. And so as we walk through our text together, what we first see in relationship to the world is that hostility and hatred is inevitable. On Sunday mornings, we're in 1 Peter, and then we come to a Wednesday night, and then we're reminded of it again. Hostility and persecution is inevitable. 
It's not a mistake that we see it again and again in Scripture. Jesus instructs us in this that when you become a believer and when you become a Christian, don't expect every day to be roses and sunshine. There is going to be adversity. There are going to be struggles, but praise be to God that he's going to see you through them. I would rather experience adversity serving the will of God and being in the center of the will of God than to experience good days and to be outside of his will. We'd rather suffer for righteousness sake rather than experience the good life living outside of his will. That's not good at all, right? Really, the reality is it's, it's a tough life. Suffering is... Uh, our hostility is inevitable. Verse 18 says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The reason why hostility is inevitable is because we're in good company. <laughs> because of who we are associated with. Jesus just called you his friend. <laughs> and as his friend, if the world hated him, what do you expect the world to do to you? It's going to hate you as well. It always makes me think of Peter, right? Peter, three times you're going to deny me. And he's, you know, just watching from afar everything taking place. Hey, hey, you, you, you know, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? <laughs> I don't, no way, I'm not his friend. No, you're his friend as his follower, as his disciple, and as his friend. We're blessed to call him friend, and he calls us friend. We're a friend of God, but at the same time, if the world hates him, what do you expect? He's going to hate us. So first, the reason... Um, hostility is inevitable. Suffering and adversity is, is, is inevitable is because we're in good company. He's our friend. world hated him. It'll hate us too. Verse 19, it says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus reminds us again, the second reason why we face hostility is because we're not of the world. Uh, when you put your faith, your trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, what does the Bible says, say to us? We are new creations in Christ. The old is past, the new has come. We do not share the same value system as the world shares. And when you don't hold the value system of the world, they either love you or they hate you and they will hate you. If you share the value system of the world, <laughs> they love you. Even the value system of the world when it comes to religion and when you're earning your way, all, road leads, all roads lead to heaven, you know? It's all right if you're going to be a Christian as long as you believe um, all the other faiths are going to make their way to heaven as well. The world will love you for that, you know? But if you're going to say, no, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only truth. And Jesus is the, is the only way to life. The world is going to hate you. When you take time to say, we believe in God's definition of marriage, he created it, he designed it, and therefore we should live in accordance with it, the world isn't going to say, we love you, we love your viewpoint, you know, we're inclusive of everybody, no, we're inclusive of everyone except for those who contradict us. The world's going to hate you. I mean, as you think about how the, the, the world hates the value systems of the world, what other ways have you seen the world hate what you stand for in regards to the word. Any other ways you've seen hatred presented towards God and the things of God in the current culture that we live in? Anyone want to share? Yeah, so fail the class because you're a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, in the university setting where you, where, um, where thought and a diversity of thought should be uh, celebrated and talked about, it's, uh, it's denied if you disagree. Yeah, did I see, Elena? Be a Christian, just don't talk about him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any, any other ways you find you've experienced hostility simply for being a, a Christian or holding the values? I mean, in the current culture we live in. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So simply telling folks Jesus loves you and he'll carry your burdens for you if you come and follow him. Uh, uh, the world responds with hate. Yeah, yeah. I think of the same one. We, uh, we were talking to someone else and just talking about the gospel and they said, I'm tired of people reminding me I'm a sinner and she about drove off past us. And so people don't want to know that uh, we're all sinners. We all fall short. We all miss the mark. And we didn't just say you're a sinner. We said we're sinners too. <laughs> we miss the mark as well. People don't want to be told they're, uh, they're sinners. They miss the mark. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, plenty of reasons why the world hates us in the, in the value system um, that we hold. Uh, Swindoll notes this, uh, uh, that we no longer live in a, a Christian nation and that our nation is not just post-Christian, our nation is anti-Christian. He says this, when political correctness forbids humor at the expense of anyone except Christians and popular culture finds blasphemy entertaining, a flood of persecution will soon follow. History has taught us that much. I mean, when you take a look at anyone portrayed within movies or television shows who are Christians, they're always portrayed in a negative manner. It's not a value, it's a burden on society. And so you see, the world is going to hate those who stand with Christ. We continue to read verse 19, because you are not of the world. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Jesus once again says, I'm your master, you're my servant. You're not just my friend, you're my servant. And those who are of me, you're going to experience what I experience as well. And then he says, if they kept my word, they will also keep Yours. Jesus says, you're so closely associated with me. If they find your word to be a blessing, or if they find my word to be a blessing, they'll find your word to be a blessing. But if they find your word to be a burden, uh, or my word to be a burden, excuse me, they'll find your word to be a burden as well. 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know who sent me. Um, just more reasons for persecution. 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, for they do not know who sent, uh, him who sent me. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. And so further why they hate Jesus and they hate those who follow him is because Jesus reveals the truth to them. And when you learn the truth about our relationship with God that's broken and we're separated from a holy God, we don't want to hear people telling us that. 23, he who hates me hates my father also. Why do we experience hostility and even persecution in the world? Because people hate God. So when the next time you're surprised when you hold the value system of Christ and, and you believe what the Bible says about things in, the, in your life or in your marriage or in your family and people say that's unacceptable and they persecute you or hate you or, or you face hostility, they hate God. That's what the scriptures say. Uh, continue to read 24 if if I had not done among them the works which no one else did they would have no sin but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father but this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law they hated me without cause why do we experience hostility and hatred and persecution from the world because it's a fulfillment of prophecy it's a fulfillment of scripture it's been written and it comes to pass and so what we get to see in our text in regards to our relationship with the world, um, hostility and hatred is inevitable and then persecution is inevitable as well as, as, as we make our way through. And if hostility and persecution are inevitable, what's the purpose behind it all? It then goes on to say that um, the Holy Spirit's testimony is influential and so is ours. Uh, 26 says, but when the helper comes, um, the idea of hostility is not a welcomed one. I don't know if, if, you know, it's not just something we're reading about, but if you've ever experienced it or, or you think about the ways that our culture should, should continue to pressure the church and believers, I mean, it's not something you welcome or you necessarily enjoy. 
But this is the encouragement. This is the courage that we can stand on. It says, but when the helper comes. Now, he's talking to his disciples. The Holy Spirit hasn't come upon them as it does in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit's already in us. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the helper abides in you. And it says, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Who, he will, who will he testify to? He will testify to the believer who's being persecuted and he'll testify to the one who is persecuting. And so what a wonderful thing to know even our witness in the face of hostility and our witness in the face of the pressures of persecution. Then verse 27 says, 27 says, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus says, you've been walking with me. These are his disciples, right? You've been walking with me. You know who I am and you will bear witness of me. As Christians, as believers, let me just ask this. Whether you face adversity or good days, are you ready to be a good witness for Christ? Do you, do you consider yourself a friend of God? Do you consider yourself a slave of Jesus Christ? Do you spend enough time with God in his word and spend enough time in prayer so if someone were to ask you about Jesus, you could say, well, let me tell you a little, about, a little, about of who, a little bit about who he is. Have you taken the time, we've been together through the Gospel of John, we've been walking through it, we've been talking about all the I am statements of Scripture. Can I tell you this, it's encouragement to me who's, as I'm teaching it, to, to take time to memorize all the I am statements so that if and when I have the opportunity to share who Jesus is, I can do so through all the I am statements of Scripture. If, if somebody should come to my door who should present to me a false gospel that I can be ready to quote some scriptures out of the gospel of John and say, I don't know about you or what Bible you're reading, but according to what Jesus says in his word, this is what he declares. And with all these I am statements, he's claiming to be the Christ. He's claiming to be the son of God. Are you ready and are you prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have that you read about in 1 Peter? Are you ready and prepared to testify of Jesus Christ to others? You know, a lot of times what holds us back is fear. You know, I don't know what to say. I don't know if I have all of the answers. Well, the good thing about witnessing to others is when they ask you a question you don't know the answer to, you don't lie to them. You say, hey, I don't know the answer to that. Let me get back to you. Let's set up a time where we can talk a little bit more and, and I'll answer that for you. And that's how God continues to equip us. And that's a, that's a great thing indeed. We are witnesses of, of Christ. Now, we'll get to this next week, but let me just read to you the next four verses just so we, we finish up the context here. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Uh, Jesus wants to prepare his disciples. He says, I don't want you to stumble. I don't want your faith to waver when you experience hostility and persecution. I want you to stand your ground. What's going to happen to all of Jesus' disciples? You know what church history teaches us? Each one of them experiences hostility, persecution, and death. He goes on to say, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. <laughs> You're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. Well, the synagogue was associated with your family as well. You get kicked out of the synagogue. You're basically sun shunned by culture. You're shunned by your family. You lose out on all of this. I mean, count the cost indeed. And it says in verse 3 or verse 2, it says they're going to think that they're, they're offering God service. I'm doing God a favor by persecuting the church. Can you think of anyone in the New Testament who thought they were doing God a favor by persecuting the church? A, good, uh, a guy by the name of Saul, who later was referred to as Paul, he was so zealous for the purity of Judaism that he was going out um, arresting people, throwing them in prison, and even going to Damascus to do the same until Jesus got a hold of his heart and changed and transformed it. Verse 3, and these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. They don't know God. But these things I have told you that when the time comes you may remember that I told you of them and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So if ever you should experience hostility, if ever you should experience persecution, you can be reminded that God is your helper who gave you this text
text to remind you that that adversity has a purpose behind it. You have an opportunity through the Holy Spirit who indwells you to be a good witness for the cause of Christ. He will enable you. He will strengthen you. He will give you the ability to stand your ground and also work in the heart of the person who is doing what they are against you and against God. And so Jesus is our helper who prepares us to witness for him even in times of hostility and times of persecution. And so uh, as we close today, let me just uh, finish with one discussion question and it would be this. Um, how has God used adversity you've experienced or, or pressures of, of persecution even that you've experienced in, in your interactions with others uh, to shine the light of Christ and to share Jesus with those who may be mocking you, ridiculing you, or um, should add pressures to you simply for being a Christian. Anybody want to share? Anybody experience any, any of that? And God work through it? You look back on it? Wow. Yeah. And they just believe that they have that power. And you know, sometimes the words come out of your mouth that you didn't really anticipate saying. And I said, well, that's so weird because you just told me you're dying of cancer. And I was uh, <laughs> embarrassed that I said that to her. And you know, she let me go again. <laughs> Yeah.
Wow. 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 Yeah. 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 So just even persevering through it for a year and God using your witness and who knows what the Lord did in her heart, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me close with one more. My, my um, when I was in college, there was this girl who texted me a hat because everyone knew I was a, a Christian. I was going to be a pastor someday, and so they they sent me this picture of a hat and said like Jesus freak on it or something, and and I, I got it and and I kind of sent a text back uh, laughing back at him, and and uh, uh, now she's a pastor's wife. So uh, <laughs> God bless her. The Lord Lord use that one. Let me let me pray for us. <laughs> Father in heaven, we uh, thank you and praise you that you're our God, uh, you're our master, you're our commanding officer, and uh, we have a desire to know your word, to obey your word, and, and to do so through the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Um, Father, as, as we gather here tonight, we're also reminded we're not just a, a servant and a slave of Jesus Christ. We're friends of God. We're friends of Jesus. And for that, we are thankful. We pray, Lord, that we would um, be encouraged by that, enabled and empowered by your spirit in light of that. And uh, Father, also in regards to hostility we should experience from the world around us for, for the cause of Christ and for standing up for the things of Christ. We, we, we thank you, Lord, for testimonies like Leslie's as she's been sharing it. And um, just, just how you work through even hard relationships and, and for us standing for you, Lord, but knowing that you've got a purpose behind it. And so, Father, even this, more, this evening, if there's anyone here who's, who's facing some of that, we pray that you would continue to encourage them, to strengthen them, to stand up for who you are, Lord, and that you would work in and through them in light of it, Father. But we thank you for your word. We pray that you would bless us as we head out and we finish up this week. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.